Hi, I'm Baka Mustard, and it's my great pleasure to talk to you today about logic programming and databases. In particular, I'd like to talk to you about Datalog. Datalog is a database query language based on logic programming. The reason I became interested in Datalog is that I'm working on an application which needs to deal with a variety of data. So some data might be available as tables, so usable from a relational database. Other parts of the data is available as graph. There's some text, which needs to be full text searchable. And there's also geospatial data attached to data points. So for example, a location. And we need to query this all together. So there are databases for all these individual types of data, but it seems hard to fit all this into one single database. So what you might first do is combine these different databases in the application. For example, if you want to query for all the friends of Alice who are talking about logic, it might look like this. So you start off with querying for all the people Alice knows, or all the friends of Alice, but not only the direct friends, but also extended friends. So you search here for depth of two. This seems to be some kind of a graph query. You then filter by friends in the vicinity of Alice. This seems to be a geospatial query. You retrieve the comments, which seems to be some of a relational query. And finally, you do a full text search on all the comments you receive for the term logic to finally be able to answer your query. So what is happening is that the application combines all these different databases and a variety of data at this level. This is not quite satisfactory, right? So one, there's the complexity. You need to deal with four different databases. The performance is not so good because you iteratively query each database individually. And the ergonomics does not seem so nice. There should be a more unified way to query this data. And that is exactly something we're going to try and solve in this talk, namely a unified approach to varied data, or a multi-model database. We will go about this by first having a look at logic programming. We will see how we can express our problems with logic programming and get a taste of how logic pro programming is evaluated. We will also see how there is some trouble in this way we evaluate logic programs. And this is where Datalog enters. Th we will see how Datalog works, the semantics of it, and how it is much more suited for database querying. We will go into the details of how to implement Datalog and also give some examples about Datalog in the wild and also some pointers on how you can get started with Datalog yourself. You will use the example of a graph to get a taste for logic programming. We can define the graph by stating the edges. Namely, there is an edge between A and B, there's an edge from A to C, and there's an edge from C to D. We can then query this program or this graph and ask, is there an edge between A and B? And our logic program will answer true. If we query if there's an edge between A and D, it will return false, as we would expect. We can do more interesting things, namely we can define more complicated predicates. We could, for example, define what it means to ha have a path between X and Y. So we say, there is a path from X to Y if there is an edge from X to Y. This is the base case. And there also can be a path from X to Y if there is an edge to egg from X to Z and a path from Z to Y. So Z is somehow an intermediary point and uh, the recursive ca uh, case. This is exactly the definition of a transitive closure. We can now query our logic program and ask, is there an edge between A and D? And it will answer, true. So this is already pretty cool. Let us go into the details of the syntax, just so we can talk about the same things. For wonders terms, 
This can either be constant values or variables. We use lowercase letters to describe constant values and uppercase for variables. There is literal. Literals are predicate symbols with, uh, with a list of argument terms. So for example, edge AB or edge XY is literal. A fact is just a literal, which we take as a fact. We denote it by just putting a dot at the end of the literal. A rule is a head literal, which is then followed by a body of literals. So for example, path XZ is the head literal, and edge XY and path YZ are the body literals. We read this as edge XY and path YZ implies path XZ. Finally, we also have a goal, which is just literal, with a question mark at the end to denote that this is kind of a query we want to make. Back to our example, we see that the first three statements for the edges, these are facts. The second, the following two statements are rules, how we, def we define this predicate path. And finally, we have a goal, path AD. We now want to understand how a goal can be resolved or how we can find a solution to a goal. This happens by a process called resolution. What we do is we take a goal and try and match it with all the facts and rule heads. In this case, our goal is pad ID. We cannot match it with any of the facts because the predicate symbols just don't match up. We can, however, match it with the head of the first rule for paths. Namely, if we set the variables X and Y to A and D, we then get the sub goal edge AD. This, however, we cannot solve because there is no fact for edge AD. So we continue and try and match our original, original goal with the next matching um, rule head, which is the sec head of the second rule. Namely, if we instantiate x with a, y with d, and z with a new variable b1, which we just introduced here. We now have a sub goal consisting of the body of the rule. We first consider the first literal of the body, which is, which is edge a v1, and see that this can be solved if we um, set v1 to b, because we have the predicate, or we have the fact, edge a b in our program. But if we, try and, if we continue and try and solve path bd, we see that this does not work. So again, we need to go back and try again. We try again with setting v1 equals c. We see that edge ac is a fact, can be solved. And also path cd can be solved by using the first rule for paths instantiated with x and y equals to c and d. Cool. So now what we've done is actually we've constructed a proof tree for our goal path ad. And we can answer true. In this case, there were only constants in our goal. But we can also solve goals where there are variables. For example, we might be interested in all the nodes which are connected to node A. So we can write this down as a goal, path A, X, and we want to figure out all the X which somehow match. We can run this in a system like Prolog, and it will return us all the answers, namely it will answer us, return us X equals B, X equals C, and X equals D. Finally, it'll answer false for some reason, which we'll understand shortly. The way this works is exactly the same. We take our goal and try to match it with the facts and rule heads. The first thing we can match is the fact that AB. We, but instead of just stopping there, we continue matching. And we see that we can match also edge AC. Still, we, we're not done. We continue. And we can see that we can match with the second rule. And we also get the solution uh, path AD. When we continue now, there are no solutions anymore. And that's why we got the false, because it's exhausted all the possibilities. This is pretty cool. So this makes us already start thinking about databases. We can get whole sets of answers for some questions, for some queries. And this could be done very easily by just hooking up this edge fact to a database call. So every time we wanted to solve a, um, uh, a goal with edge, we just query the database. 
This, however, is not very efficient. For one, there are multiple calls to the same for the same fact, namely in this example, there are two databases calls for the edge AC fact. We would need to introduce some caching mechanism to make this efficient. And secondly, uh, a database call is expensive. So what we want to do is collect the database call and uh, query a whole range of values from the database. This is something we will solve with data, data log. Nevertheless, we can now start thinking about how we can um, write down usual database queries in our logic programming framework. For example, a simple join. We have here two tables. One is a table of comments with the column's username and the comment itself. And a second table which contains likes. So users can like comments. We are now interested in which users liked which authors. So this is a join of the tables comment and like. What we do is we just define this rule likes author and we have as variables who and author. So we say likes who likes which comment and the comment should be authored by author. This is how we can define or how we can write down simple relational algebra queries such as a join. If you reflect on this a bit, we see that when we define a rule, we are not defining a procedure on how to compute something. We are really defining a relation between values. So in our previous examples, we always queried in one direction. So we always were interested in what is the what are the nodes which can be reached from A. But it's completely possible to query in the other direction. Right? So our rules defined a relationship, and we could query this relationship in any direction. So really, we are closer to relational algebra than maybe imperative programming here. So we've got our first taste of logic programming. The examples and the syntax we've seen is mostly Prolog inspired. However, we've only used a very, very basic set of features from Prolog. So the things we were talking about, they apply to general logic programming and to frameworks such as mini Canren. The syntax is very minimal and still we're able to express a lot of, lot of different things. In fact, uh, what we've seen is uh, Turing complete and this is kind of a double-edged sword. So we've already seen that we get infinite recursions or we cannot guarantee termination of a program. This has to do with that. It's also, we've also seen that it's not declarative. Just by switching up the rules, we can um, change the meaning of a program substantially. Uh, furthermore, it is not efficient for querying databases. As we've seen, individual facts are retrieved individually from a database, and this is not efficient for large amounts of data. We will solve these problems while keeping the advantages with data log. The syntax of data log is exactly the same as we've seen for general logic programming. Namely, there are terms, which can be either constant values or variables. There are literals, which can either be predicate, which are, which is a predicate symbol followed by a list of argument terms. There are facts, rules, and goals. However, unlike in general logic programming, there are certain re restrictions we have on what can appear in a data log program. For one, an edge, uh, sorry, a fact can only contain constants. We call a literal, which has only constants in its uh, argument terms, ground. So for example, the literal edge AB is ground. In a data log program, every fact must be ground. So edge AB would be a valid fact in a data log program, whereas edge AX, where X is a variable, would not be a valid fact in a data log program. We also require that for every rule appearing in a data log program, the variables appearing in the head of the rule must also appear in the body of the rule. For example, um, in PXY, the Y variable does not appear in the body in SX or TX. This is not a valid rule in a data log program. These are the only two re restrictions we have on the type of uh, facts or rules which can, which can appear in a data log program. And these two rules ensure that the solution 
of a data program is finite. In general logic programming, there was no distinction between the types of predicate symbols. So for example, we had the edge predicates or the edge facts, which somehow denoted things we could still have could have stored in the database. And the path thing, path predicate or the path rule, which defines something which is more like a query. But there was no explicit distinction between these two predicate symbols. In data log, we need to make this distinction very explicit. So we differentiate between extensional predicates, which together they form the extensional database, uh, consisting of all the ground facts which are stored in the database. This is opposed to the intentional database. These are predicate symbols which are defined in our query and program, but are not kind of externally stored. They are really part of a query. So we make this distinction between things which are stored in a database, the extensional database, and things we are kind of interested in, or things we define rules on, our intentional database. This distinction is very important because this allows us to define the mapping or define data log as a mapping from an EDB to an IDB. In order to make this mapping precise, we need to understand exactly what a rule means. So if you have a rule of the form L0 as head literal and the literals L1 to LN as body literals, we define a first order logic formula of the form for all the variables appearing in the rule, in this case x1 to xm, the conjunction of all the body literals implies the head literal. This really captures our intuition of what a rule means. Namely, if all the body literals are true in some sense, then the head literal must be true as well. We identify a data log, a data log program P as a set of all formulas appearing in the data log program. We want to make it uh, slightly more exact what it means to be true under certain circumstances. And for this, we need the concept of interpretations. An interpretation is a subset of ground literals of all predicate symbols and all possible constants appearing in the EDB and IDB. In the example of our graph, we had the predicate symbols edge and path, and the constants A, B, C, and D. An interpretation is a subset of the predicate symbols, edge or path, and a combination of any possible constants which appear in our graph. We say that a ground literal is satisfied by an interpretation if it appears in the interpretation itself. We extend this idea and definition for logical formulas itself, and then say that a logical formula is satisfied by an interpretation, or if a whole set of formulas program, we say that an interpretation satisfies a program. In our example, we have um, I0, which has edge AB, edge AC, edge CD, path AB, and path AC. This interpretation does not satisfy the program P, which we see in the bottom half, with the two formulas. For example, because there is no path CD. For all as, as for all assignments of x and y, so also for c and d, we do have edge c d, but there is no path c d in the interpretation. So the interpretation is not satisfied. The interpretation does not satisfy p. On the other hand, the interpretation i one does satisfy our program p. We call an interpretation which satisfies a program a model of the program. In this example, i one is a model of p. However, there are more than there is more than one model for a program P. For example, I2 is a model of P. It contains all the literals which also appear in I1, but it also includes some superfluous literals, ground literals like path AA, which we would not ex have expected to be in our solution to the data log program. Still, this I2 satisfies all the formulas that define the data log program P. This sounds a bit like trouble, so there is not a single model for a data log program P. Instead, there are multiple models. How do we choose which model is the solution we are looking for? Luckily, it happens to be that the intersection of the models is also a model. 
and even more luckier for us, the intersection of all models, which is also a model, is unique. And in fact, this unique minimal model of the program P is exactly the solution of a dialog program we think of. And we actually can make this very precise. So we define the meaning of a dialog program P, or the solution of a dialog program P, to be the minimal model of P that contains the EDB E. Let us take a moment to appreciate the fact that the meaning or the semantics of a dialog program is exactly defined. It is unique, and I would argue, maps very well to our intuition of what a logic program should mean. This definition of the semantics of dialog is based on model theory, a branch of mathematical logic. There are alternative definitions of the semantics. One is the proof theoretic semantics, and the other is the fixed point semantics. Luckily, they are bo both all equivalent. The proof theoretic semantics looks more at the syntactic form of the dialog program, and is a bit similar to the resolution we saw with uh, for general logic programming. The fixed point semantic defines a procedure which adds solutions to for a dialog program, and the solution happens to be a fixed point of this procedure. We can also look at the dialog from a more relational algebra point of view. We can relate to every predicate symbol which appears in our data log program a relation. So for example, for the predicate symbol paths, we have the relation path which contains all the solutions to the, thing path, to the, to the predicate paths. Similarly, we have the relation edge which corresponds to the predicate symbol edge. Every rule in our data log program corresponds to a relational algebra inequality. So for example, path xy if edge xy relates to the relational algebra inequality, edge is a subset of path. More complicated, the second rule, path xy if edge xz and path zy relates to the relational algebra inequality, the join of edge path projected on xy is a subset of path. And in fact, the union of all these, all the right hand signs of all these inequalities is exactly the solution we are looking for. So the relation, the final solution relation path is the union of edge plus the second, the right hand side of the second inequality. This captures somehow the minimal model idea in the sense that there is no extra, extra members of the relation path. There is just what we define in the rules. This relational algebra viewpoint of data log leads us to our first evaluation algorithm. Namely, we can see a data log program as a system of relational equations. For every IDB relation I, mapping to an IDB predicate symbol I, we have a relational expression consisting of the IDB relations and also the EDB relations. This, in general, is a recursive system of relational equations, so that I0 might appear in the definition of I0 itself. We can still solve this by iteratively, by iteratively going through this. So we initialize our IDB relations with an empty relation and evaluate the, the expressions one by one until we reach a fixed point. This evaluation strategy is called the naive evaluation. This evaluation algorithm is called naive because it's uh, obviously the first thing we think of, but it's also not very efficient in the sense that many things are recomputed multiple times. We can be a bit more clever about this and figure out that we don't need to add the entire IDB relation every time we evaluate the expression for the IDB relation, but we just need the differential or some of the difference of things that came new into this uh, relational expression. This is called semi-naive evaluation. And this is actually pretty good already. In a lot of data log implementations, use semi-naive evaluation and it works fine on pretty large sets of data. So, we already have a pretty good evaluation algorithm for our data log. Something which is a bit weird, we never talked about goals. And what this evaluation algorithm does, it evaluates or computes the entire relation, the entire IDB relations, and all IDB relations. If we have a goal, maybe such something like path AD, we are not interested in the entire relation path. We are just interested in AD in the relation paths. And these bottom-up evaluation algorithms, which is a name for naive and semi-naive evaluation, is a bit inefficient because it unnecessarily computes a lot of things. 
Another way of doing this is with top-down evaluation. One algorithm for top-down evaluation is the query-subquery algorithm. This is very similar to the resolution we saw for general logic programming, but it's a bit more clever in the sense that it's, it works on relations instead of individual tuples. For this, it needs to do a lot of internal bookkeeping and be clever about a lot of things. So I find it a bit tricky to implement. And then another way of doing this is with magic sets. And this is really not a top down, but you rewrite your data log program. So it is in, in, itself is restricted and will only compute what is necessary. You then use a bottom up evaluation algorithm, but you only need to compute the necessary facts. So we're almost ready to go out and write our own data log evaluation algorithm. There's one th thing to keep in mind. And that is the reason why data log is so much more efficient when working with large, large sets of data. That is, that data log works on entire relations, not on individual tuples. When working with in-memory relations, we might use something like a weight balance binary tree. These are data structures, in-memory data structures, which allow efficient range queries. When doing so persistence, persistently and on disk, we might use ordered key value stores, such as LMDB. These are very similar to key value stores, but they, in addition, also allow range queries. So you can efficiently ask for all the key and value uh, pairs uh, for all the keys between 1 and 20, for example. This is exactly where the efficiency of um, data log comes in. And it's pretty cool that existing uh, tools such as LMDB or LevelDB exists, so you don't need to worry about all these transaction details and all these things. You can use battle-tested or the key value stores to build up your data log database. I'd invite you to read up on the SRFI 167 and 168 uh, documents. And also, there's a talk by Amirush Bebeki, the author of these documents, at uh, the last FOSTEM, where he talks about our key value stores. So now we have all the ingredients we need to build our own data log engine. Let's go over them. What you need is a high performance order key value store, such as LMDB or LevelDB. You need an in memory data structure for working with relations while evaluating. You need to implement your favorite data log evaluation algorithm. This might be semi naive evaluation or query subquery. And you need a bit of relational algebra to evaluate relational algebra expressions. And that's really all you need to build your data log engine. So now the only thing which is stopping you from implementing your own data log engine might be just be a bit of motivation. So let us try and get at that as well and have a look at the relationship between relational algebra and data log. The main difference between data log and relational algebra is that data log is capable of computing recursive queries. This is what we use to compute the path predicates in data log or this transitive closure. In relational algebra, you are not able to do express something like this or compute something like this. There might be extensions to SQL which allow you to do these kind of things, but in general it is not possible to express this in relational algebra. I would argue that this is something very, very valuable, especially in, in the world we live in, in which systems are connected, data is connected, and we are always interested in the relation between data. Recursive queries allows us to express meaningful queries on such kind of data. The reason why relational algebra is not a proper subset of data log is that in relational algebra, we are able to express negation with the set minus. In data log, there is no such concept of negation, and we're not able to express or compute queries which have negation in them. However, this is slightly tricky to uh, add to data log, as we need to be very careful to not break the other nice properties we have in data log. This is, however, possible, and the way this is done is with stratified negation. The idea behind this is that you split up your program into different stratas and evaluate strata for strata, and then you're able to introduce negation without breaking any of your nice properties of data log. Another common uh, addition or extension to the data log is monotonic aggregation. So the ability to compute things like the maximum over a relation. These are all uh, well understood and well documented extensions of data log, which you can also implement. Nevertheless, even in the core data log we've seen so far, without these extensions, we are able to express very interesting things. For example, we can express the initial problem we've had with our multi-model application in data log as such. We introduce a helper predicate, extended friends, which captures the meaning of being either a friend or a friend of a friend. This is very similar to the 
transitive closure we've seen with the path predicate in our graph example. However, this is bounded to a depth of 2, so there's no recursive call in this. Then we introduce this talking about logic predicate with this rule which says that extended friends of Alice, which are in the vicinity of Alice, and have positive comments, and in this comment there should be a mention of logic. This, I would argue, is a much, much more natural way of uh, composing such a query. And individual um, relations or predicates we've used in this, in this query can be reused all over the place. It is much more a composing with relations than an imperative collecting of values and filtering. I would argue that this is a much nicer way of interacting with such multi-model data. There is one little trick missing to be able to implement this efficiently. For example, our predicate in vicinity is an EDB predicate, so it is stored in some database, external database, or some ordered key value store. The question remains, how would you index this, or how would you store this in this, in this ordered key value store to be able to do such queries efficiently? This is the topic of indexing strategies, and how can you create an index to be able to do efficient geospatial queries. Similarly, full text search is a, is a is a whole other story on how you would index such a data to be able to search for occurrences of certain terms efficiently. All these various indexing strategies which exist and are well discussed in the literature can be implemented and unified in Datalog. And I think this is really the power of Datalog. It gives you a unified interface over all these different in indexes. So I hope I convinced you that Datalog is indeed something very interesting. It is simple, the syntax is very minimal, it's capable of expressing very interesting problems, it can be implemented to run efficiently, it is very declarative in a very, very strong sense, even more so than Prolog or general logic programming, and what's more, it is guaranteed to terminate, or the solution of a data log program is finite for a finite database. This of course comes with the flip side that data log is not Turing complete. But this might be something not so bad, you maybe don't want a database query language to be Turing complete. And really, data log is not a general programming language, or it's not able to express anything. But maybe it's just a defined spot as, a, as the perfect database query language. And I hope to inspire you to do your own research and tinkle with your own little database based on data log. I'd like to give you a couple of pointers on how Datalog has been used and how you might be interested in using Datalog. Datalog has been used for massive scales of data. Two examples of this is our Yetalog, where Datalog is compiled to a MapReduce system and used on really, really large sets of data. This was some research done at Google. Another example is distributed social light, where data log is used on large social network graphs. What I am personally more interested in is the opposite of this, namely data log in very, very small devices are for small data. It'd be interesting to see how small a data log implementation can be made and if it would fit on an, an embedded device. This might be interesting because you can f you could possibly fit an entire data log engine, which can do very complicated queries, directly in some sensor device. Another application is web browsers. And there are actually in the ClojureScript community there's a project called DataScript, which does exactly this. Another interesting application is in unikernels. For example, Mirage OS. Data log is small enough that you can implement this completely in, for example, OCaml and not rely on any external database to do meaningful and interesting queries on your data. This happens to be exactly the scope of a project I'm currently working on, DREAM. In DREAM, we are researching peer-to-peer -peer group collaboration protocols and doing research on data models to do such kind of things. This includes query languages, which is data log, but also on the infrastructure and how people can host this or how small organizations and activists can host such an infrastructure. For this, we're looking at unikernels. There's something else which makes data log very, very interesting for peer-to-peer -peer and decentralized systems. In fact, it can be shown that programs that are eventually consistent and can work coordination-free without any co conflict are exactly the programs which are expressible in data log. This is known as the COM principle, or 
consistency as logical monotony. And I do invite you to read up on, on work by Joseph Hallstein and Peter Alvaro, who are doing extremely interesting work on this topic. On a more practical note, if you're interested in getting started with Datalog immediately, I'd recommend you to check out Souffle. Souffle is a Datalog implementation, which includes all the basic things we were talking about in this talk, but also features such as negation, monotonic aggregation, the ability to hook up to real databases, and many more. Definitely worth checking out, and there's a lot of cool things you can do with Souffle. For a more simpler start, I'd recommend the ABC Datalog, which is a very simple Java implementation of Datalog with a very nice graphical user interface. Many of the things I've told you about Datalog in this talk have not been super exact and a bit sloppy. So if you're interested in a more detailed and exact treatment of Datalog, I'd highly recommend this book, Logic Programming a Database, which is also where I take the title for this talk from. The authors of, the of this book have also released a paper called What You Always Wanted to Know About Datalog But Never Dared to Ask, which is a great introduction to the topic. Another book that I can highly recommend is the Alice book, or Foundations of Databases. Uh, chapters 12 to 15, I believe, uh, go into detail about data log, and they also present a very nice exposition of the query-subquery algorithm. And if you're interested in implementing the query-subquery algorithm, I would highly recommend to check out this book. If you're more interested in general logic programming and not specifically logic programming for databases, I can highly recommend the mini Canren, as presented in the book The Reason Schemer. The book presents a very, very minimal and beautiful uh, logic programming framework and special, specifically emphasize that logic programming is about relations and composing relations to do very nice things. William Bird, one of the authors, has also recently given a FOSTEM talk and I do recommend you to check it out. Finally, I'd like to mention a project I've been working on which sparked my interest in data log, Open Engadina. With Open Engadina, we're developing a platform for local open knowledge. Open local knowledge, or knowledge, comes in a wide variety of different forms and shapes. And this is exactly why we use Datalog to query and work with this data in a meaningful way and a unified way. Open Engadina is supported by NGI0 and the LNN Foundation, for which we are very, very grateful. So, I hope you enjoyed this talk, and I very much hoped to have sparked your interest in Datalog a bit. I plan to post a write-up of this talk on my site, inqlab.net, with also more references to other projects and further reading. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much.